Once the credits roll on a horror movie and audiences stop watching, that's it. The characters in the movie are frozen in time, left exactly where they were in the final frame of the film. Nothing else happens to them, but real life has no credits. The cameras never stop rolling. People aren't just left standing in a certain place for the rest of time, their lives move on. That can create some interesting dissonance between horror films based on true stories and the actual events that inspired them. Whilst the cinematic versions of these tales wrap everything up in a nice little bow, reality is far messier than fiction, and there's often more to a story than what goes into a Hollywood picture. I'm Jess from World Culture, and here are 10 horror movies that left out the true horrific ending. Number 10, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The original 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre shares some of its DNA with Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and Jonathan Demme's The Silence of the Lambs. All three films take some inspiration from Ed Gein, a real-life killer with a habit of making trinkets out of dead people's bones and skin. Sound familiar? Gein was not the only real-life figure that the writers borrowed from in the movie. In an interview with Texas Monthly, Kim Henkel revealed that another genuine criminal was part of Leatherface's character. Elmer Wayne Henley was an accomplice to an older serial killer in the 70s, helping him lose his victims back to his home. As Henkel says, I saw some news reports where Elmer Wayne said, I did these crimes and I'm gonna stand up and take it like a man. Well, that struck me as interesting that he had this conventional morality at that point. The disparity between Henley's utterly monstrous actions and his apparent moral compass is extremely disturbing. How can one man commit such heinous acts and own up to them with such an apparent lack of guilt? It's unsettling and a vital detail missing from the first massacre film. Number nine, Eaten Alive. Another Henkel creation now, but a much less famous one than Leatherface's big screen debut. Two years after the massacre in Texas, Henkel once again teamed up with Toby Hooper to create Eaten Alive, a horror movie with a distinctly reptilian twist. It tells the story of Judd, a deranged hotel owner in the rural south who uses a crocodile as part of his violent outbursts. The film opens with Judd stabbing a prostitute with a pitchfork before chasing her into the waiting jaws of his pet croc. The giant beastie kills a few more people, including Judd himself before the film is done, but it didn't claim nearly as many victims as the creature it was based on. Eaten Alive is based loosely on the actions of Joe Ball, a saloon owner who lived in Texas in the early 20th century. As a publicity stunt, Ball built a pond containing six alligators and charged people to feed them. Oh, and he also allegedly used them to dispose of the bodies of up to 20 women he killed. This is way more calculated than Judd's methods, somehow making being fed to a giant crocodile even worse. Number 8. The Hills Have Eyes an extremely messed up movie about a family of cannibals living in the desert, The Hills Have Eyes unsurprisingly comes from the ever so twisted brain of Wes Craven. The man behind A Nightmare on Elm Street and Scream was searching for inspiration for his new film in the mid 70s, and in doing so came across the legend of Sawney Bean. Don't let his silly name fool you, Mr. Bean was no laughing matter. A supposed cannibal from 16th century Scotland, Bean was a bandit and the head of a clan of 45 fellow criminals. Oh, and he and his kin also supposedly killed an 8 over 1,000 people. You would not catch Rowan Atkinson doing that. Historians say there's a lack of sufficient evidence to declare that Sawney is anything more than a myth, but if he did exist, then his transgressions are way worse than the events of The Hills Have Eyes. Bean's posse killed way more people than Papa Jupiter's, and whilst it could be argued that the fictional family were just trying to survive, Sawney's group were after gold and riches. Although comparing the ethics of murderous cannibals is a bit of a waste of time. Number 7. Scream Another West Craven property now, and the most meta horror story since the rise to power of Mark Zuckerberg. Scream revolves around a slasher villain inspired by movie slasher villains. The original Ghostface is obsessed with horror films and uses them as a motif throughout his murderous rampage. Things get even more confusing when you realize that this fictional killer, inspired by other fictional killers, was actually based on a real person. Screenwriter Kevin Williamson became paranoid after hearing a new story about the Gainesville Ripper. The Ripper, real name Danny Rowling, murdered five students in a four-day killing spree in 1990. The fear felt by Williamson eventually inspired the first draft of Scream. However, Williamson left out one key detail about Rowling's actions. Whilst the fictional Billy Loomis is inspired by horror movies, the real-world killer said he committed his horrific crimes because he wanted to be famous. He cited Ted Bundy as a role model, never a good sign, and claimed he wanted to become a superstar off the back of his murders. This contorted motivation proves that Rowling was completely lacking in morals in a way that's somehow even scarier than his on screen counterpart. Number 6. Hounds of Love 
Sadly not a Kate Bush biopic, 2016's Hounds of Love is an Australian horror movie based on a few different actual murders. In the film, a young woman must escape her captors by persuading a woman that the man she's in love with is actually manipulating her. It's a chilling tale of physical and psychological abuse, and it draws inspiration from the real-life case of David and Catherine Burney. The Burneys, better known as the Morehouse murderers, were a couple who kidnapped and killed four women in 1986. A fifth victim escaped with her life, leading to their arrest. So the Burneys have already claimed more victims than the couple in Hounds of Love that we know of, but things get even more chilling when you find out what happened after they were caught. David hanged himself in prison in 2005 after being implicated in the sexual assault of a fellow inmate. As for Catherine, she's still alive and has tried and failed multiple times to get parole. The fact that David was still committing crimes after his imprisonment and the idea that Catherine could be released one day makes for a disturbing epilogue to an already distressing tale. Number 5. The Town That Dreaded Sundown Whilst 2014's The Town That Dreaded Sundown gets a bit weird and self-reflexive, the original movie by that name is a fictionalized account of the 1946 Texarkana Moonlight Murders. Five people were killed by the so-called Phantom Killer, who, as you can probably work out from their name, was never caught. The 1976 movie is faithful to this, ending with a tense shootout between cops and the hooded murderer before the latter flees into the night. What the film fails to mention, though, is the rumored sixth victim of the Phantom. A few days after the final confirmed murder, the body of Earl Mc McSpadden was found on a set of train tracks. Postmortems confirmed that McSpadden had been dead when he was dumped, leading to some speculation that the Phantom had struck again. Imagine if McSpadden was another of the Phantom's casualties. That opens up a whole host of questions about the Phantom's true body count. The thought of a serial killer who never got caught is scary enough, so it's no wonder this movie chose to omit the fact that his killing spree might have lasted a lot longer. Number 4. Snowtown Despite sounding like somewhere Santa Claus goes on his day off, Snowtown in South Australia is anything but a jolly place. And I'd like to apologize for all Australians for how many horrifying movies we've made. It was the site of the Bodies and Barrels murders in which a group of men killed 12 people and hid their remains inside barrels stored in an abandoned bank. The murders took place over the course of seven years and the trial was one of the most covered in Australian legal history. The Snowtown murders were fictionalized by director Justin Cazell in 2011. Whilst Cazell did a good job in conveying the twisted reasoning behind the killings, he left out the aftermath the case had on the town after which the movie was named. Snowtown initially received an economic boost off the back of the murders, as true crime enthusiasts and undoubtedly a few weirdos flocked to the site of such a famous wrongdoing. However, once this bump died down, the town was struck with the stigma of the Bodies in Barrels case. The community even discussed changing the settlement's name. Snowtown is the perfect example of how one group's unthinkable actions can have consequences reaching even further than first thought. Number 3. Open Water The disappearances of Thomas and Eileen Lonigan in 1998 served as the blueprints for the 2003 horror movie Open Water. In the film, two divers end up separated from their group and stranded out at sea with no food and a pack of hungry sharks circling them. When a boat finally arrives to collect them, they vanished, never to be seen again. This is pretty true to life, as neither of the Lonigans have ever been found. What's missing from the film, though, is the utter hell that their families have been put through in the years since this tragedy. It was originally suggested that the couple faked their own deaths for financial gain, which is a horrible thing to say to a grieving family. Then, over the next few years, pieces of the pair's diving equipment kept washing up on shore. This included a note from Thomas begging someone to come rescue him and his wife. Reading what amounts to the final words of a loved one is a truly unthinkable pain, one matched only by the thought of never knowing what actually happened to the Lonigans. Number 2. The Exorcism of Emily Rose Laura Linney stars in this 2005 horror and courtroom drama as a skeptical lawyer prosecuting a priest. Said clergyman is being charged with negligent homicide after the titular Emily Rose died whilst he was performing an exorcism on her. The real-life Emily Rose was a German woman named Anneliese Mitchell, whose parents and priests were actually convicted following her death in 1976. However, whilst Emily Rose died after just one exorcism, Anneliese was subjected to 67 spread out over 10 months. Mitchell actually died of malnutrition after she was starved for the better part of a year in accordance with the Catholic rituals. At the time of her death, she couldn't walk unassisted and weighed just 66 pounds. The exorcisms themselves might have directly caused Annalisa's death, but a catastrophic chain of events led to her demise. Not only did higher-ups in the church approve of the multiple excruciating procedures she went through, but so did her parents. This was a young woman who needed someone to protect her, but nobody stepped up to the plate. The real case of Emily Rose is a chilling story and a warning of the perils of an over-reliance on faith. Number 1. The Girl Next Door 
No actual murders are nice to hear about, but the vicious killing of teenager Sylvia Likens is especially unpleasant. Sylvia and her sister Jenny were living with a woman named Gertrude Benazelski whilst their mother was serving jail time. Over the course of three months, Gertrude orchestrated the routine physical and mental torture of Sylvia, often letting neighboring children and her own kids beat, burn, and starve the poor girl. Sylvia died at the age of just 16 after experiencing untold horrors in her final few months. In 2007, a film called The Girl Next Door portrayed a fictionalized version of Sylvia's abuse and was dedicated to her memory. At the end of the feature, the perpetrators of the vile crimes are arrested. This happened in real life too, with Banizowski, two of her children, and two others ending up in jail. However, despite her part in the brutal death of a young girl, Banizowski was released after just 14 years in prison for her good conduct whilst inside. The sad truth is that bad people often get away with doing bad things. The unspeakable actions of Gertrude should have resulted in her rotting in jail for life, but unfortunately, that's not always how the world works. That's the end of our list, but let me know down in that comment box if you can think of any other horror movies that left out the true horrific ending. As always, I've been Jess from What Culture. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you like, you can come say hi to me on my Twitter account where I'm at Jess McDonald. Let's stay tuned to us here for plenty more horror lists.